Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the third lecture of this course on network systems. Um, uh, as you recall, um, uh, you can find uh, all of the material that I cover in, uh, in this text here on, on the left, uh, which is available off of my website. And in the first two chapters, we reviewed some example systems and some example problems or so natural research questions that uh, arise from interesting examples from all walks of life. You know, some examples are scientific, others are engineering examples. Um, in chapter two, we reviewed uh, basic matrix theory, including uh, Jordan normal forms and various notions of convergence for a discrete time matrix. We reviewed the Gersh scoring this theorem, saw that it was not sufficient to establish all the properties we wanted for our row stochastic matrices. And then we, we saw the beautiful and powerful Perron Frobenius theory that allows, that tells you much information about, about uh, the existence and the location of a dominant eigenvalue and about the non-negativity or strict positivity of the uh, associated dominant eigenvectors. All right, perfect. So today, what I want to talk to you, I want to talk to you about graph theory. So now, uh, let me start from, from the end for fun, just to, just to make a change. I'm going to go, I'm gonna go backward today. So um, graph theory is a beautiful subject. Um, uh, it was popularized uh, in, in the second half of, of the last century by the work of, of, a, of a person, uh, Frank Harari. In his book, uh, uh, Harari uh, uh, says how Euler in, in 1741 uh, may be called the father of graph theory and also of topology as he settled a famous unsolved problem called the Konigsberg bridge problem. So the Konigsberg bridge problem, you should look it up on, on Wikipedia. It's a fun motion planning problem. So if you want to do robotics uh, with graphs, you should absolutely uh, know that the uh, citizens of the city of Königsberg um, uh, are ultimately unable to execute a single walk through their city, crossing all of their bridges only precisely once. That, that is now what I would call almost like a motion planning problem. Later on, um, a century later, Kirchhoff and then Kelly uh, used graph theory to address physical problems. Kirchhoff uh, studied the uh, electric circuits, right? And, and defined what are now known as the two voltage and current Kirchhoff laws. And Cayley uh, used, uh, used graphs to, to study uh, chemistry, to understand and enumerate um, chemical isomers. Hmm? All right, so there are by now many standard books in graph theory. And, and I am not going to, um, you know, here I mentioned two, but there are truly plenty. Beautiful subject, beautiful subject, very elegant. So now, um, while I am going to, be, before I proceed, let me mention that um, uh, graphs capture the structure of many famous data sets out there in the literature. So, uh, if you want to find examples of graphs that are relevant uh, for purposes beyond the, the purposes of this class, here I have listed three uh, uh, data sets, databases, databases of data sets. Um, uh, for example, that Stanford Large Network uh, Dataset Collection, the Suit Sparse Matrix Collection, uh, and the UCI Network Data Repository with corresponding links here. These are websites where, from where you can download examples of graphs that, that come from all walks of life. Again, may they be engineering systems, scientific systems, and so forth. So I'll let you, I'll let you peruse these links uh, uh, at your pleasure. Here are three examples. Uh, this is an example of a, of a power grid, the, uh, very highly simplified, uh, uh, and reduced in dimension uh, uh, of the North, North American power grid. This is an example. This is a famous example of a sociological network. Uh, Samson did a famous PhD in 69, uh, collecting uh, the interaction between uh, um, 
between monks in a monastery and recorded that and that has been uh, has become a standard data set in sociology nowadays and in social network analysis and this is yet a completely different model this is the example of uh, of a water supply network right with some reservoir here you see you see five reservoir i have highly simplified the picture in the data set you will also find where where pumps are and where other uh, devices of the water distribution network are located hmm? the the other thing that it's kind of fun to uh, to know is that if you want to manipulate graphs so if you want to manipulate matrices i imagine i didn't say it last uh, in lecture two but you're all familiar with the concept that uh, you you can you can run uh, MATLAB or its free clone Octave. You can run you can run in Python. There are libraries for for matrix manipulation. Lots of software to perform computation on matrices, and of course the same is true for graphs. Hmm? And or or some of these uh, uh, software refer to them as networks, but it's really exactly the same. And so. For example, in Python, there's a network X is a, is a library that, uh, uh, for example, computes an object called condensation uh, directed graphs, which is uh, precisely one of the things I will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, Gephi is a standalone uh, visualization, exploration, interaction software. Cytoscape and Graphviz are other are other choices. Hmm? So you get to, you get, and there are many more. For example, uh, MATLAB, Mathematica, Maple and, and uh, um, um, uh, have lots of, uh, lots of routines that allow you to manipulate graphs. Hmm? All right, perfect. So, um, all right, so graph theory, uh, now that I've given, I started from the end, I've given you this introduction, graph theory is a very uh, rich, okay, so let's, uh, let's write this out. So what have we done? We've, uh, um, We've um, we've reviewed the history and background. And, and really most of what I'll do today is really, I wanna to refer to it as language. So I will, I will, I will draw pictures and, and give you names of, of objects that you can easily discern from the picture. So, even though it, it is called graph theory, but today I'm not going to do a theory. I'm only going to um, introduce those words that are that are key to be able to reason about graphical objects. Graph objects or graphical object is the same. Um, right. There are some some theorems. Uh, I'll show you one theorem only, the condensation digraph theorem. But other than that, there are some theorems in the exercises. And then all of the mathematical, the theoretical results that I need, all of them, that it's not language, right? You, you uh, Usually what you do is you introduce some notions and then you characterize their properties, right? Most of the properties that I'm going to need, I will introduce them as I need them later in the chapter. So, so for in this simple chapter, I'm only going to introduce, mostly going to introduce just some language hmm, that we find that we find useful. Hmm? And then I guess the, there is only one result, which is this uh, condensation. All right, okay, perfect. So this is a relatively light, light chapter, shorter comparison with chapter two, which was more intense. And certainly chapter four will begin to use, to introduce some theorems about graphs, algebraic graph theory, in fact, that I, that I will need. All right, perfect. All right, now it's the time when I, I, if I have um, well, I'll finished my, my, my introduction. And, and now it's the time when I'm going to start to give you some some definitions. So these are some of these graph, some of these slides are crowded, but hopefully you can follow them with me without too much uh, without too much uh, effort. So uh, first of all, um, first of all, one thing that can trick uh, readers is the concept of graph and digraph or directed graphs, or or people or some people call it digraphs, and it's the same as digraphs. So and I. Hopefully I will be consistent. So I'm going to start with the concept of an undirected graph, hmm? undirected graph, there, there it is. So some people just call them graphs and that's the problem with the language. So if, if you read a document, a Wikipedia page, a book, an, a new article, an old article, if you talk with your friends about what is a graph, you need to always be careful. And some authors may not be, 
but you need to be careful whether it's undirected or directed. Okay, so for now, these are undirected graphs. Hmm? What's a graph? A graph is a, is a collection of two objects, a set of nodes V and a set E of unordered pairs of nodes called edges. So a pair of node is called an edge. Hmm? A pair of nodes called an edge. So if I, if I have two nodes U and V, I would write um, a curly brackets U comma V to denote an unordered edge. That's because this is an undirected graph. And here I have, and by the way, U has to be different from V. So there are no, they're not allowed in an undirected graph are pairs of sets where you will use the same element. Hmm? Okay, so now if you have a graph, you can draw it. Hmm? What you see here in the second half of the picture of the slide are seven pictures of seven different graphs. This particular graphs have even names of their own right. It is not true that any arbitrary graph has a name, but these are particularly special and they, they, they get a name and even a symbol. So this is a graph which has six nodes, right? And they're connected on a, on, a, on a line. And some people call this a line graph, but that's not a good name. The, the correct name is path graph. This is a path graph with six nodes. If I ever need to refer to it with a symbol, which will be very unlikely, I will denote it by the, the symbol P sub six. Then if I say P six, then you understand P one, P two, P three, P. Well, P one is just a single node. P two is two nodes with one edge between them. Now, if you, if you take uh, the path graph and you add an additional edge from the first to the sixth node, then what you obtain is called a cycle or a ring graph. So here, this is the example, right? There are six nodes um, and the symbol is C6, cycle six. Also possible instead, a rather different construction is the concept of a star graph. A star graph, with six nodes, that means you have one center node and five, um, what do we wanna call them? Uh, later on, I will call those, at some point in time, I might call those nodes leaves. Hmm? They have just one connection back to the center of the star graph. Now, it's also possible to uh, uh, introduce the uh, complete graph. Here you have six nodes and I have drawn every possible edge between any two distinct nodes. Once again, in the case of an undirected graph, it is customary not to have self edges or self loops or connections from a node to itself. All right, perfect. Now, people are also interested. There are some problems where, for example, in a combinatorial optimization, imagine you have to associate tasks to individuals who are going to execute the tasks. Then the association of one individual to a task is well captured by a graph which is biparted. So a biparted graph is a graph where you have nodes, one, one set of nodes on, on, let's say, one side and another set of nodes on the other side. And the edges between the nodes are always and only from nodes that are blue to nodes that are, that are red, let's say. Hmm? So let, I'm gonna call the ones on the right, I'm gonna call them the red nodes. Hmm? Okay, that's a bipartite graph. And, that particular picture that I'm illustrating here is a 3-3 biparted graph because there are three nodes on the left and three nodes on the right. And it is the complete biparted graph because I have drawn every single possible edge between, between any two nodes um, on the left and nodes on the right. In this picture right now, I'll give you a few seconds, there is another biparted graph that we have already seen. And, and it is the star graph, because if the star graph is the part biparted graph uh, with, uh, with uh, one and five, right? And now the edges are always and only from the star to the leaves, as I said. So that would be the star graph is also K15, okay, hmm? S6. All right, now, in, in uh, very, very common, of course, in, uh, for example, numerical analysis, you, you lay down a grid uh, over, over, over an environment, over a mesh, over, over a, and you do computation over it. 
Um, so that's that's this is an example. I have one, two, three, four nodes, and these I have seven nodes there. So this is G47, it's two-dimensional grid graph. People sometimes refer to it as the Cartesian graph. And then then I just here I added one. We're not going to use this uh, much at all. It's just an example graph. It's a fun little graph to look at. Um, it's called the Peterson graph. Um, this graph um, has numerous features uh, that are kind of fun to think about. Now look, each node has exactly three neighbors, one, two, three, and, and each node has exactly three neighbors. So whenever I introduce the language of neighbors, so if you are a node, every other node that you're connected with, I will refer to as a neighbor. And the number of neighbors, I will refer to as your degree. So this the Peterson graph is a regular graph because it has a constant degree, a homogeneous degree for all of the nodes that it possesses. And so, and the, the degree here, D may be equal to just three. Perfect. Uh, the cycle graph is also regular. Each, um, each node has degree two. The complete graph is also regular. Each node has degree D equal to five. In general, regular graphs with equal, where, whereby each node has an equal number of neighbors are, are not common, but they're but they do they do they do appear. All right. Notice that the the grid graph is all in in a way one could argue is kind of similar because uh, each node in the interior has the same number of neighbors four, right? But the nodes on the boundary have lower degree. This node has degree two, and all of these nodes have degree three, right? Okay. Perfect. Right. I already. I have already introduced these definitions, this language. If you have, uh, if if UV is an is an edge, then then U and V are neighbors. Um, sometimes I will write I will write uh, this symbol here. So neighbors of a node V in the graph G to denote the set of neighbors. Hmm? Sometimes you just don't even use the symbol G because there's only one graph you're working with, so you don't need to specify it, but if you do, then you use it as a subscript. I have defined the notion of what's the degree of a node, what, when is a graph regular, and I've given you some examples. Now, okay, so now I am ready to talk about directed graphs or digraphs. Hmm? So now, uh, uh, look at this picture here. So now I have changed the pictures, and these pictures are now contain, contain edges. Hmm? So each Pardon me, let me be uh, clarify. Let me clarify. So this connection between these two nodes now is direct. There's a direction, there's an edge. So if this node is U and that node is V, then that edge being depicted is the edge U comma V. Hmm? So now I have not, I'm not using curly brackets. I'm, I'm using round, round parentheses to really denote the fact that it is an ordered pair. Hmm? It's entirely possible that you may have that both uv and vu are edges. For example, here I have drawn now the complete graph. No, I have drawn the complete digraph. The complete digraph is very different from the complete graph, right? Because now I have that. Let me let me zoom in here. Then between any two nodes, this is a node, and that's that's u. I don't know why that's v. It doesn't matter. I have the edge. The, the, the edge is going both ways. So I have the edge going 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 from u to v, and from v to u, right? But I also have, in the case of digraphs, it is customary. It is a useful convention to allow also self loops. So in digraphs, we will have self loops. Entirely possible. All right. I know it's a little bit arbitrary. Uh, it's it's just useful, as I was mentioning. In uh, in practice, it's a useful concept to adopt. So in digraphs, you can write u u, and that's a self loop uh, uh, from u to u. All right. Now, uh, where was I? So I didn't I didn't use a certain language. Let me use another language. If the number of nodes is n, if you have n nodes, then um, then the graph is said to be of order n hmm? of order n. Um, by the way, a little back of the envelope calculation. If you have n nodes, how many edges can a graph have? Well, let's do a directed graph. How many edges can a directed graph have? Well, the largest number is captured by the 
um, by the complete directed graph. For each node is connected to itself and n minus one other nodes. So the bottom line is that the number of edges, which I will often denote with the symbol m in, in, um, um, in a digraph, with n nodes, the number of edges m is upper bounded by n square, hmm? n square. What's the lower bound? Well, the lower bound is, would be kind of silly, but I could give you a digraph without edges, so an empty digraph. Maybe I write an algorithm which I start with an empty digraph and then I add edges to it. In that case, of course, m would have to be, would have to be zero as the lower, lower bound. Now, right, uh, people keep using the same names, nodes and edges, even for directed edges. Hmm. Right. And, and uh, this is a cycle digraph with six nodes. This is the complete digraph with six nodes. And this is an, another example. This is a digraph which has no directed cycles. Hmm. What's a directed cycle? What's a directed cycle? So let's maybe uh, remember that I need to define this and I will do so in, in two slides. All right. Uh, intuitively, the directed side. I'm not soon going to be interested in in using these graphs for for walking purposes. I want to walk on the graph. So pick a node, any node. Here's a node. I want to walk on that node. If I follow the direction of the edges from this node, let's call it uh, one, then I can go to two, and from two I can go either to three, four, or five. On this graph. Every walk that you can take is finite. I cannot walk forever because either I cannot walk forever respecting the direction of the edges, right? On the other hand, if you come to the cycle digraph, of course you can walk forever because you can just keep walking around, uh, around the cycle, right? All right, these are directed cycles. Hmm? All right, perfect. But it is entirely possible to define cycles also for graphs, which is what we're gonna do soon. Soon enough. Before I do that, let me clarify that just like if you have uh, if you have a matrix, you can drop some rows and columns and you get a sub matrix. Or if you have a set, if you have a set of objects and you drop some objects, you now have a subset. You can define a subgraph. It's only a little bit unusual to think about it because as, once again, a, a graph G is a pair. So that's the key formula. It's not a picture. The picture is a visualization of the graph, right? A graph G is a pair. Now, it's a little bit, you, you, you certainly know what does it mean for V prime to be a subset of V. That means that every element of V prime is in V. Possibly V contains even other elements. It's just a subset. The graph has two sets. So basically a graph G prime equal to V prime E prime is a subgraph when both have to happen. V prime is a subset of V and E prime has to be a subset of E. That's all you need to remember essentially that to be a subgraph, both your, your sets of nodes and sets of edges need to be subsets of the corresponding sets of nodes and edges for the full graph, right? So for example, you know, anytime, anytime you have a graph, let's say we take the path graph there, that's a path graph, a subgraph could be could be this node and that node, and this and then this edge. Hmm? That's a subgraph. Also, it would be the, the, the two nodes in red are a subgraph of the path graph. So, eh, right? Okay. Entirely possible. I could even add this node, by the way. Hmm? I could have those three nodes are my subgraph. Hmm? All right, fine. Uh, maybe maybe it's useful if I just write it out. So if this is node one, two, three, four, and five, the graph G would be one, two, three, four, and five. And then the graph G has a collection of edges, which is the edge from, well, this is an undirected graph. So the edge from one to two, the edge from two to three, the edge from three to four. I know this is a little bit boring, but just in case there was any doubt. And now this is a set of edges. So I have two curly brackets and then the parenthesis closes. The subgraph G prime, which which is in red, let's say G prime, contains only the nodes one, two, and five. And it contains only one edge, the edge from one to two, right? You cannot add, you cannot have, you cannot have G prime contain the, the edge from, you cannot add here the edge 
from uh, two to three. Why can you not do that? Well, because the set of edges of a graph need to be edges between nodes of the graph. And if the graph G prime does not contain the node three, then you cannot have the, you cannot have a graph where you have an edge which starts and goes, goes somewhere. Hmm? Well, in chapter one, we've seen the example of compartmental flow systems and we had those off edges, but the, the inflow into the system, the outflow, but, but here, at least for this clean modeling at this moment in time, I'm not gonna worry about that. I'm not gonna model that. Now, another simple concept is that if you have a sub, you could define a subgraph by simply calling it spanning. You, you could say, hey, I have the, um, I have the blue subgraph here, this one, right? The, the path graph, there it is. And I will pick some nodes, for example, as we said, one, two, and five. And I will, I will take from the, all of the edges that are possible among those nodes. And so that is called the spanning subgraph. I apologize, I actually made a mistake. That was the concept of an induced subgraph. So let me let me give my definition again. I think that's quite a mistake, I'm so sorry. So a spanning subgraph, let me write it as a spanning subgraph has the property that V prime is equal to V. Right, right, right. An induced subgraph has the property that uh, the so if you if you look at v prime which is contained in v, then the edges e prime contain all the edges contain e prime contains all the edges e between two nodes that are of course in v but that are also in v prime. All right, thank you for your patience. So spanning is you touch all nodes. Induced is you take a subset of nodes and you save all of the edges in the original graph that are still edges in the subgraph. Perfect. Now. Um, we define, I wrote a symbol, I wrote n sub g of u before to denote the collection of neighbors in a graph. Now, if you are a subgraph, if you are a node in a subgraph, I am going to now draw a convenient picture like that. u1, u2, u3, u4, and u5. Now, who are your neighbors if you are in a directed graph? Who are your neighbors? Well, well, you have two types of neighbors. You have neighbors uh, that, that you're connected with, with an edge where you are at the, at the end of the edge, right? Hmm? Um, and instead, you have neighbors where the, uh, uh, the directed edge originates at your location and goes to the other, to the other neighbor, right? So, the language is this, the language is that these are in neighbors. Basically the edges are of the form U comma V and then there are out neighbors where the edges of the form V comma U. Perhaps the second definition is very intuitive. The concept is that uh, you have, um, sorry for the phone call, you have, um, you outgoing edges go to your out neighbors. Incoming edges are coming from your in neighbors, right? And so if you want to be accurate, you need to, um, uh, if you want to write N for the set of neighbors, you need to have superscripts to clarify which, uh, which one of the two do you mean? Hmm? Perfect. You can also define the set of in neighbors, which are the collection of in neighbors and set of out neighbors at this time. So now this particular node V in this picture here in the middle of the slide clearly has, well, let me just write it, has D in of V equal to two and D out of V equal to three. What do I mean by that? The number of in neighbors is called the in degree and the number of out neighbors is called the out degree. Hmm? So two in neighbors, in degree equal to two, out degree equal to three. Hmm? Very simple, very simple. As I said, uh, we're not giving big theorems here. It's just some, it's just a language so that you look at the picture and you can, you can say, hey, node number, node denoted by the symbol alpha has 
uh, a three in neighbors, hmm? the node, the node and, and then a five out neighbors. So this is the kind of discussions that you need to be able to, to have. And some graphs have the characteristic, just like before we were talking about regularity, right? In an indirect graph, but regular. In a, in, a, in a directed graph, you can define this weaker concept, the concept of being topologically balanced. Topologically balanced means that uh, each node has the same in and out degree for each node. Huh? So this particular example that I have in the middle of the, of the slide is not the topologically balanced because node V has two in neighbors and three out neighbors. So that, that, that doesn't work. But for example, uh, if you recall the cycle graph a few minutes ago, let's, let's draw the cycle graph with dimension four. Then this of course is topologically balanced because the in and out of degree of each node is precisely equal to one. Perfect. So now, Let's now talk about these uh, walks that we want to that we want to take. Uh, here, I'm going to use the language path or walk indistinguishably. Mm -hmm. um, in the literature, this is not uh, a unique convi convi uh, unique unique uh, language. M most people use the word the word walk. I think but that's okay. So, all right. So now we need to be careful because we're going to have paths in undirected graphs. And then paths, next slide will be paths in directed graphs. Huh? All right, perfect. So, well, uh, a path in a undirected graph um, here, let's take, let's take this graph. Let's call this graph the triangle. Hmm? One, two, three. Then a path is just an ordered sequences of nodes. Hmm? In such a way, actually, let's take a more, more elaborate example. Um, um, such a way that any pair well, let me read the definition with you carefully. A path is a sequence of nodes, but it's an order sequence, not just a collection. It's an order sequence such that any pair of success of consecutive nodes uh, is an edge of the graph. So here you can you can again it's really intuitive, it's it's really like, and this is the wrong symbol. We want a parenthesis. So maybe you start a node two, you go to three, from three you go to four, from four you can only go back to three. Uh, one, two, once you're two, you go to one, you go to three, you go to four, and so forth. Finite, finite length, right? A simple path is a path where no nodes appear more than once. Hmm? For example, you would say one, two, three is a simple, pardon me, I wrote two, one, two, three is a simple path. Now, a simple path, in a simple path, no nodes is repeated. So that's simple. Now, I don't want to study paths that have the property of coming back to the location from where the path started. So I want to consider, for example, this path. Um, this path that does one, so one to two, two to three, three to one. And so then I would get one, two, three, one. I want to extend the definition of simple to include the possibility that, okay, no node is repeated, except possibly the case in which the initial node is the same as the final node. So this here is a simple path. Uh, the node one is repeated, but it is repeated only at the beginning at the end. This earlier example that I did at the beginning, that one is not simple at all because uh, the nodes are repeated and you know more multiple nodes are repeated uh, throughout the execution for example here the node the, the node the three oops me. the node three appears twice right and actually it appears even three times as well so it's not so perfect simple path now uh, a graph is connected all right so let's let's look at this example here this graph, if I think of this graph with uh, how many nodes? These are um, um, one, two, three, four, five, six nodes, right? If I think of that graph with six nodes, is it connected? Now, what does the word connected, what might it mean? It means that from any node, there exists a path that takes you to another node. It doesn't need to be simple, although you, there is no loss of generality. You can take it to be simple. This graph is clearly not connected. All of the examples of graphs that I have given to you were connected. So for example, the path graph is connected. The star graph is connected. The cycle graph is connected and so on and so forth. So all of the, 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 the Cartesian grid for sure is connected. All of those examples 
were connected. Here in figure 3.3, I've given you an example of a picture uh, of, a, of a graph that is not connected. Now, whenever a graph is not connected, then it is always possible and rather simple to virtually imagine drawing a line and understanding that if you now consider the graph with nodes um, one, two, three, the subgraph with nodes one, two, three, or more accurately, you say the subgraph, uh, um, right, induced by the nodes one, two, three, with therefore you also have these edges, then that's a connected subgraph, right? Which one is the connected subgraph? V equal to one, two, three, and edge equal to um, one, two, and two, three. Hmm? So that's a connected subgraph. Similarly, a connected subgraph is also the other one, right? So what happens here? What happens is that if you have a, um, if you have a disconnected graph, it is always, it can always be considered to be the union of connected components of the graph. Hmm? It's always possible. Hmm? So a graph is either connected And actually, you know what? Let's make it even more, more, uh, more elegant. A graph of order n. Order n means it has n nodes, right? A graph of order n is either connected, so it has a single connected component of size n, or it contains some number. Let's use another symbol. Let's use the number, the number uh, uh, l. It contains l connected components. How many connected components can a graph contain at most? Well, L, well, here we said that, that it's either connected or it's disconnected. So then the number of connected components for a disconnected graph, it's, it's at least two. You could have just L equal to one. That would be the case of one single connected component. If I give you a graph with, without any edge, then that graph will have and you, you think of one node as being connected. I know it's a little bit of an extension of the definition, but in any case, um, at most you have N connected components. All right, perfect. Now, um, I need to give you one more definition. So a graph, an undirected graph may contain a cycle. Now a cycle is a simple path cycle, which is an, un, or let me be even more specific, an undirected cycle is a simple path, um, which is to say no nodes is repeated, right? Where the first node is equal to the last node, hmm? is the first node is equal to the last node, so it's closed. But there's one more property um, that is required of length, three or more, allow me to clarify. So I could imagine the path four, five, and six, and four. Now, this path is a cycle in the graph. It's an undirected cycle. You go from four, remember this is six, right? This is six, five, and four. I hope you can see. That's, an, that's a, an undirected path. It's a simple path, no node is repeated. The first and last node are equal. So I start from four, I go to five, I go to six, and then I go back to four. Hmm? And it's of length three of more. What does length of three or more? It means that at least three nodes are attached. And so this is one, two, three, three hops. Hmm? The, the length of a path is the number of edges you need to traverse. So if I give you a sequence of four nodes, there are three hops, three edges. Hmm? So it's not the number of nodes that, that are in the path, it's, the, it's that minus one, it's the number of edges. All right. Now, I do not, it is customary not to allow in a graph paths uh, as a cycle, paths of the form one, two, one. So start at one, go to two, and then go back to one, right? That would be a path, it's a simple path, it exists in the graph. Um, it has the first node equal to the last node. It has length two instead of length three. 
And so in graph theory, in the theory of undirected graph, then there is digraph theory, which we're going to talk about in a second. This is not a cycle in an undirected graph. Okay, does that, hope that makes sense to you all. All right, so in graph, in undirected graphs, cycles have to have length at least three. And visually what that means is that you literally want to do something like that. You don't want to go back and forth. Back and forth are not allowed as cycles. All right, perfect. If a graph contains no cycles, then for example, which then it's called a tree. So here, um, in these three examples here, which one is a tree and which one contains a cycle? Well, clearly the cycle graph uh, contains a cycle, obviously, so it's not a tree. However, both the path graph and the star graph contain no cycle, right? Because they contain no cycles, they are referred to as trees. A tree. And I have the definition right here. So let me maybe just one more time. The cycle is a simple path that starts and ends on the same node and has at least three distinct nodes. A graph is acyclic if it contains no cycles. And a connected acyclic graph is called a tree. Okay, so here my definitions are slightly more accurate than the ones that I gave in the following slide. Let me clarify how they're more accurate. So, first of all, I need a cycle of length three. More accurately, I need three distinct nodes. So I cannot go from A to B, back to A, back to B, back to A. That would have length four, but I'm still only using two nodes. So the correct definition, you need to have three distinct nodes. And, and um, okay, here a graph is acyclic, if it has no cycle, or right, that's almost just English. Finally, if I have no cycle, um, a tree also has the property of being connected. Hmm? I was, I forgot about that um, for, for a second. All right, perfect. Good that I went back and I checked. Right. Um, um, okay. Let's take, um, let's take a second. All right, perfect. Where were we at? Um, this is um, uh, path and connectivity graphs. Before I continue, let me take a step back. So one more clarification about this idea that a, a, a graph is uh, either a, a connected or it is the union of connected components. And the question is, what is a connected component to be precise? Huh? Connected component, what is it? Well, a connected component is a subgraph. Hmm? with two properties. One property is that it is connected. So of course you wouldn't call it a connected component if it wasn't connected. But the other property is also very important is that it is maximal in being connected. Here's what I mean by it. So if you look at the picture here, uh, four, five, and six uh, induce a connected component because the subgraph of the node four, five, six, as, as illustrated here in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this ellipse, right? That one is a subgraph, it's connected, and it has the feature that if you try to add another node, it's not connected anymore. If you try to add a node one to it, it's not gonna be connected. The connected subgraph induced by one and two, however, is not a connected component because you could add the node three and it would still be connected. So it's not maximal in being connected. You could add one more, one more node. All right. So now you see that with this definition, then this particular uh, uh, decomposition of the graph one, two, three, four, five, six into one, two, three, and four, five, six is unique. The unique decomposition into the connected components for an undirected graph. Undirected graph. Now, let's try to generalize all of these concepts of paths, of walks, and of connectivity in direct graph, and then the, comp the decomposition. So this is the task that we have, and this is section 3.2. All right, first of all, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, the, the hardest thing to remember is that now we don't have paths or walks, we have directed paths. So I know it's boring, but to be clear, the language should really be just keep remembering the directed paths. Hmm? 
And it's an order sequence of nodes such that any pair of consecutive nodes in the sequence is directed edge of the digraph. So this is the same definition as before, except that the prefix di, as in directed, is present everywhere. It's present in a, in a directed path, digraph, an order sequence of such that in a, in a directed edge of the digraph. And same definition as before, a, a directed a path is simple. Um, if no nodes appear more than once, but then I want to allow, I want to be able to define cycles, right? So I need to allow the possibility that the first and, and the final node, the initial and final nodes are equal. In that case, that's going to be called the cycle, right? Of course. In, in a directed, right, a, a cycle, now in, in directed graph theory, right, a cycle, you have a directed path that starts and ends at the same nodes. And let me add the property of being simple here for simplicity. So when I define a cycle, I, I, I in, in, Typically, uh, I'm just going to think of it as simple directly. Mm -hmm. Now, here comes the kicker. In a digraph, the cycle, let's suppose this is the node number u. So u, u is a self loop and it's a cycle of length one. Mm -hmm. Also, entirely possible, let's imagine that I have this graph uv, then u, v, u. It's a cycle of length two. So in uh, uh, for directed cycle theory, it is customary to accept as feasible cycles in digraph, also cycles of length one, which are self loops, or cycles of length two, which is composed of just two nodes, hmm? like here, uv, vu. Um, in any case, and that was also true for undirected graph, I didn't say it, but it was true. The set of cycles, the set of simple cycles, uh, um, in a directed graph is finite. Hmm? There's only so many possible cycles if you don't allow repetition of, of nodes. Hmm? And also, there's one more thing you want to make it clear, you want to clarify. So imagine this is node one, this is node two, this is node three. A cycle is one, two, three, one. Now, I don't want to burden you with uh, lots of uh, notation, but there, here's another cycle. Two, three, one, two. Hmm? Is it a different cycle or is it the same cycle? Actually, this is the same cycle. It's just basically has a different start node, but it's really the same, the same closed path on, on, on the graph. So essentially, I'm gonna, I'm, you know, we're not gonna worry about this, it's not important, but just a little detail. Uh, there's almost like an equality sign between those two, those two, those two cycles, right? Perfect. And as before, it, a digraph is acyclic if it contains no cycles. And here I notice that my notes are not perfect because I should really say, well, I probably should say directed cycle here. Well, you know, a person, become, you get a little bit tired of writing directed cycles or, you know, directed everywhere. But right now we are in the theory of directed graphs. And so therefore everything is directed. Now, um, um, here's some more language. In a digraph, every node of degree zero, of, of oh, sorry, of in degree zero is called the source. So in other words, uh, if you have an edge, if you have an edge, for example, it goes down like that, right? And this is U, and this is V, then you can use the following language. U is a source and V is the sink, hmm? source and sink. And if you have zero in neighbors, I, I apologize. Let me say. Let me say it better. I, I didn't say it right. I, I, I did say it precisely wrong. U is a source and V is a sink for that edge, for that specific edge. Now, more generally, if you have an entire directed graph, a source is a node that has no in neighbor. So here, there are no edges going into that node. So that's why that node is a source. And this node has no out neighbors. Therefore, it's a sink. And these are, this is language that is borrowed from compartmental systems, for example. If you imagine that this, there is a commodity like water that is flowing, then, well, if the water flows along the edge, uh, this node has, you know, must be a source of water because, you know, where's the water coming from? And when the water goes to this node and it has no out neighbors, well, it must, it must be a sink. All right, so that's why, that's the, the intuition of, uh, of uh, right, for a single node, so, sorry, for a single edge, you could still call this the source or the sink. Other language is the, the, the head and the tail. I, I don't know, I don't use this very commonly, but anyway. Now, 
if you have a, if you have a graph such as that one, which is a directed cycle, it has no source and no sink, right? There is no source and no sink there. Here you have two sources and one sink in this in this picture here on the left. Perfect. Now, um, some more language, and then we are. So one last one last piece of language. I need to generalize the notion of tree. So now we are in a directed graph, and there may exist a directed tree. A directed tree. We are in the concept of a, you have a digraph. And it's acyclic, huh? um, right? But it has one more property. One more property. Directed tree. So this picture here, this is not a directed tree. Hmm? A directed tree has one more property. The property is that there exists a node called the root such that any other node of the digraph can be reached by one and only one path starting at the root. So um, um, for example, you may have a situation where you have a node and then it has three out edges and then it, this one has more and so on and so forth. This picture here at the bottom is a directed tree. It's acyclic, there is no directed cycle. And moreover, from the root node, which is, let's call it R, to any node, let's call this U, from R to U, there exists only one and only one path. If I were to now take one more edge and add it from, U, from R directly to U, that would still be a directed graph. There would still be no directed cycle. So it would be acyclic, it would be an acyclic digraph, but it would not be a directed tree because in a directed tree, uh, there can only be one directed path from R to U. And in this picture, there would be two. Okay, perfect. All right. Now, we saw that for undirected graph, it was very clear to talk about connectivity properties. For example, this is connected and this graph is not connected. And moreover, this graph can be broken up into the union of two subgraphs, which are connected and maximal. Perfect. How do I generalize these notions of connectivity to directed graphs? Now, this is beginning to become a little less obvious and intuitive, right, and immediate. It's not difficult, but you just have to think about it a little bit. Um, all right, so I want to generalize this, so I need to eliminate that. That's too that's too simplified. So let's let's clean that up. Now we're playing with the with a, with digraphs. Hmm? So um, it turns out that in digraphs, instead of there being one notion of connectivity, just one, here I'm presenting to you four, and believe me, there are even more. Hmm? Four notions of connectivity instead of one. Um, First notion, a directed graph G, G is strongly connected if there exists a directed path from any node to any other node. So for example, uh, that graph, which was the directed cycle, this is uh, length five, it's strongly connected because from any node, you can follow a directed path and go to all other nodes. Now, in the previous slide, I drew this picture, right? Um, in this picture, from one no specific node, the root, you can go everywhere else. Hmm? That means, so a graph may possess a spanning tree, a directed spanning tree, if one of its nodes is the root of a directed path to every other node. So a graph is said to, con to con contain a directed spanning tree if there exists a node from which you can go everywhere. It's directed because you're following directed path. It's spanning because you go everywhere. And it's, it's a directed tree because there's at least one path. You can always eliminate some edges if the path is not unique. Now, a no, a G, the directed graph, is said to possess a globally reachable node. And this is a very simple language. If one of its nodes can be reached from any other node, by traversing a directed path. Essentially, uh, uh, containing a directed spanning tree or containing global reachable node are, are the inverse of each other. 
Can I go to one node from everywhere? That means possessing a globally reachable node. Or can I go from one node to everywhere? And that is containing a directed spanning tree. The last property labeled number two here is, is the possibility that your directed graph is weakly connected. Weakly connected means you take all the edges and you they're directed and you remove their direct, their orientation. You just make them undirected. And the graph is said to be weakly connected uh, if the undirected version of the digraph where you remove the orientation of the edges is connected. Okay, so now let's look at an example. Uh, well, this example was strongly connected. This example here, uh, this example uh, um, in figure 3.5, that's also strongly connected. Let's just check. So from two, I can go to three. From three, I can go to four. From four, I can go to five. And from four, I can go to two. So even without looking at the rest, I know that all of these are reachable from any one of them to every one of the other ones. Hmm? I'm also following, I'm kind of following an algorithm here. So pick a node and see if you can, if you can find a closed cycle that comes back to it. If you do, then clearly all of these nodes live together in some sense. Hmm? And we're gonna have to make sense of that. Now, additionally, from two, I can go to one, from one, I can go to six. From six, I can go back to two. But that means that from two, I can go anywhere. And from anywhere, I can go back to two. Hmm? So, so this is a strongly connected directed graph. Clearly, if it's strongly connected and I remove the, um, um, the direction of the edges, then clearly a strongly connected digraph is also weakly connected. And each node of a strongly connected digraph is globally reachable. And each node is the source or the root of a directed path that goes to every other node. Mm -hmm. so, so this, what I've just described to you, it's actually a little theorem, essentially. I just described the fact that property one is the strongest and it implies property two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Now, here in, in this example B, what have I done? I have changed the direction of this edge and no other changes. Mm -hmm. I've only changed the direction of that edge from two to three. So now it's not strongly connected anymore. There is a problem. What is the problem? If you are at two, you can only go to one. If you're at one, you go to six. And from six, you go back to two. Now, if I draw this circle here that encloses two, one, and six, notice that, what are we noticing? If you draw this line like that, you can think of that as a cut. If you were to take a knife and cut that graph in two, or more accurately, if you were to draw this on a piece of paper and cut the paper with the scissor, then along this red cut, every edge that crosses the cut is crossing from one direction to the other, right? So in other words, from nodes three, four, and five, you can go to one, two, and six, but not back. So, this graph, this directed graph here, uh, graph B here at the bottom, contains one, more precisely three, globally reachable nodes. That's the nodes one, two, and six, but it is not strongly connected. I cannot go back to some of the others. Hmm? Uh, it also contains spanning trees. It, you could start at node three, go to four, from four, you go to five, from five, you go to two, from two, you go to one, and from one, you go to six. So that's a spanning directed tree, right? A cyclic. So this graph has both a directed spanning tree with a root and at least one, in fact, you can make it three globally reachable nodes, but it is not strongly connected. All right. Uh, by the way, one last thing. If I have a graph, digraph, and I change the direction, then I call it the reverse digraph. And the reason I introduced it here is just to clarify that a digraph contains a direct spanning tree if and only if its reverse digraph contains a globally reachable node. And that's precise. If you change all the directions, then, then these two properties here that I gave, so property three and four, as I said, are, are the, the converse, the transpose. If you change, if you invert the direction of the edges, one property becomes the other. Perfect. 
One more concept uh, is that of periodicity, the periodicity of strongly connected diagrams. And let me just uh, uh, teach you this by means of example. A periodic diagraph, um, this, this, a periodic diagraph is a diagraph that has a period and the period here is of length two. And the period is because you start at this node and you, and it's the periodicity of a path. So there exists a path from one to two, back to two to one. And so here there exists a path that has, that is periodic because if this is node one and that's node two, then you can do one, two, one, two, one, and so forth with period two. Now, um, this graph has two possible periodic, uh, you, could, you could do, it has two simple paths, one of length two and one of length one. But then it's aperiodic because the length of its um, of its simple cycles are one and two, and um, and and so there is. It is not true that all of the uh, uh, cycles that are not simple on the digraph have to be a multiple of the period. Mm -hmm. So let me let me give you the the precise definition. A strongly connected direct graph is periodic if there exists a k, a k greater than one, not one, greater than one, called the period of the digraph, that divides the length of every cycle of the graph, hmm? of the directed graph. Um, let's, let's clarify that here. Directed. Perfect. In other words, um, a digraph is periodic if the greatest common divisor of the lengths of all the cycles is larger than one. And a digraph is periodic, is aperiodic if it's not periodic, but that's, that's almost just like English. So now here, uh, uh, this is one, the, the example B is one and two. This example, the lengths are, look at this, this is two and this is three, right? If you look at the picture here, let me do it like this. You can see that one uh, simple cycle has length two and another simple cycle has length three. As soon as you say two and three, two and three are co-prime numbers that do not have a common divisor. So the graph is aperiodic. As soon as you see a self-loop, you know the graph is aperiodic because one of the lengths is, is period one. Okay, perfect. So another possibility is you can draw, you can draw pictures like this. Uh, one to two, to three, to four. This is periodic. Now, if I add this edge going back, this is still periodic because now I have a cycle of length two and a cycle of length four. So when I don't have that edge, the period is four. When I add this edge, now the period is two, mm -hmm. still periodic. If I add a self loop, the graph is aperiodic. The more edges you add, the more likely it is that the graph is aperiodic. Mm -hmm. um, if, I add, if I add this edge, now I have a cycle of length, of length three. And so then it's the lengths are three and four, and therefore the graph is aperiodic. All right, perfect. Okay, this is section 3.3.3. Now I'm ready to talk about condensation. Hmm? Condensation is this idea that uh, it almost comes from, uh, from chemistry. So the idea is that as you heat up certain elements, they will, they will condense. Hmm? So now here, here's the idea. The idea is, Every time I have nodes that, two nodes, U and V, with the property that I can go from U to V and from V to U, these two nodes are going to condense and become one single meta node. Hmm? So for example, here, look at this picture here. If I do a circle here, clearly I can go back and forth. Therefore, this is going to become a single node, huh? a single node. I'm gonna use the, there's a graphical language here. This is the node that uh, I guess I should have drawn it in red to be consistent with the picture. So if I draw a red circle here, that uh, this is, is that, and this becomes that, okay? So there's a process here, a process of condensation. Now, then you can come here and you can say, okay, Francesco, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in this node. Let's start from this node and find out who are who are all of its, I don't know what to call it, colleagues uh, that belong, that, that are reachable from and, and, and backward, you know, from and to that node. So now if you take this node, you can grow this set, just that node. You can say, well, clearly these two are strongly connected. 
Now, also, you can go one, two, three, right? So then this is strongly connected. And it's maximal in being strongly connected. It's a subgraph. As a subgraph, it's strongly connected. And it's maximal in being strongly connected because I cannot add any more edges to it. Uh, I cannot add any more nodes to it. So here's the picture, right? So these three nodes is a subgraph and it's strongly connected and you cannot make it and it's maximal in that. So it's called, what we're looking for is the definition of a strongly connected component of G. So as I said before, it's a subgraph, it's strongly connected and it's not just a strongly connected subgraph, it's maximal in that property. And so now here, this corresponds to this subgraph here, this one in blue. And we map this to this node right there. And I will explain this last step in a second. So you keep going around the, your directed graph and you, you, you compute, uh, you know, here I've done it visually. You have to do this on a computer, right? You compute all of its strongly connected components. And one can prove, just like I did before, that each directed oops, graph is either strongly connected or it contains L strongly connected components. I'm gonna write SCC, strongly connected components. And clearly L is less than equal than N where N is the order of the digraph, which is to say the order of the digraph, uh, as you remember, is the number of nodes in the digraph, right? Okay, perfect. So now there is one difference between graph and digraphs. In digraphs, when you do the, the composition, into the strongly connected components, you can do one more step, which you are unable to do in undirected graphs. You could do one more step. And what is that step? The fact is that you did not use all of the edges. So here, let me enlarge. Here, you, do, you drew this red sub uh, SCC, strongly connected component, but there's more information in the original graph that you have, that you are now you're losing. And the information is of course, these edges here. There is a directed edge, from the brown SCC to the red SCC, that directed edge, it crosses the lines, right? And here there's a bunch, there's a bunch, there's numerous uh, such, such lines. There's this line, that line, every edge that crosses from one SCC to another SCC, I'm going to use that information. I'm not gonna throw it away. And I'm going to say that there is a directed edge from the strongly connected uh, uh, um, component blue to the brown one, there is this directed edge here, if and only if there was a directed edge from the blue to the brown there. Specifically, there were two here that were going from the dark blue to the brown, but I don't care. I'm just gonna draw only one here, of course. And then uh, let's just check this, um, uh, this uh, uh, component here on the bottom left is the green one. And notice the green one, there is an edge to the green one from the blue one. So this edge in red that is present in the original digraph gives rise to this edge here. Okay, so now we're ready for the definition. Hopefully you got the intuition. So if I have a directed graph, I can condense it. What I mean by that is I can compute something called the condensation digraph over digraph G. And people use the symbol C of G. And you define the condensation as follows. You need to define the nodes and the edges, right? Because we are defining a sub, um, we are defining a directed graph. So I need to define what are the nodes and what are the directed edges. So the nodes of C of G are the strongly connected components of G. And all of the SCCs are the nodes. And moreover, I need to define the edges. Here I'll say there exists a directed edge, if and only if. So there exists a directed edge from node capital H1 to node capital H2. So remember, the nodes of the condensation are subgraphs of the original graph, right? There exists a node in the condensation from a subgraph to another subgraph, actually from a strongly connected component to another strongly connected component, if and only if 
there exists a directed edge in G from a node of H1 to a node of H2. It doesn't matter which one. And so this is now explained this, uh, this picture here. How do you go from the left uh, original digraph all the way to this uh, condensation? Now, as you look at the condensation, you immediately see something obvious. There can be no directed cycles in the condensation. It is absolutely impossible. If there was a, uh, a cycle, for a directed cycle, maybe I go one, two, and then I come back. But if you see a cycle, then you have made a mistake in computing your condensation, because now these three, the union of those three subgraphs would be strongly connected and would be a subgraph. And so therefore you have a larger strongly connected subgraph, but that's impossible because we said that the strongly connected component is maximal in that. All right, so the beauty of the condensation, you know that it's a directed acyclic graph, directed acyclic graph. Some, some people, especially in computer science and programming, it's very common to refer to directed acyclic graphs as DAGs, D-A-Gs. Perfect, so I give you an arbitrary digraph, very complicated, you know, imagine millions of nodes. It is entirely, it's, it's possible that exist algorithms that will compute for you its condensation, which is gonna be much smaller. Hmm? And, and this condensation will have, even in dynamical systems over, over, over networks, this has gonna be very important consequences. For example, if it's a flow, if there is a compartmental flow system where there are commodities, you entirely understand, right? That this is gonna be a source of sorts where material are, the commodities injected, and these are all the sinks, right? All right, perfect. Now, as a last um, uh, statement for today, um, um, actually I have one more after one. Um, finally, there is a theorem here. I'm not gonna prove it. The proof is, is based on logic. It's rather straightforward. Uh, the theorem is a theorem that tells you the properties of condensation diagrams. And there are three properties that I am interested in that we're going to use later on. One is, the condensation is acyclic. That's what I just said. And I actually just gave you an intuition for the proof. If you were to find the directed cycle, then your decomposition into the SECs is necessarily wrong. So by contradiction, there can be no directed cycle. The second property is that when you do the condensation, certain properties, the weak connectivity properties of the original digraphs are preserved in the following sense. G is weakly connected if and only if its condensation is weakly connected. So you don't lose anything regarding weak connectivity when you do the condensation. It's just, the property remains unchanged. Moreover, the second property is the one that it's very useful. The, the, sorry, I should say the third property. If G contains a globally reachable node, if and only if its condensation contains a globally reachable node. But if you have a globally reachable node in a graph that is acyclic and it's directed, right? So imagine you have, imagine this node number two is globally reachable. Is it possible that that node too has an outgoing edge, is it possible? Well, imagine this outgoing edge, well, imagine an outgoing edge must close on some other node, right? It must be an edge, a directed edge of the graph. But if this, as let me make it a little more elaborate, if this edge exists, then you can immediately find a counter, a, a problem with it, a counter, a counter example, because if this, if this edge exists, then you can find the directed cycle in the condensation, which we just said in property one, we said that it was impossible. So such an edge here cannot exist. And so what that means is that the condensation, if the original digraph has a globally reachable node, that globally reachable node ends up belonging in a sink of the condensation. Mm? And the condensation must have a unique sink mm? because if the node is globally reachable, it's also not possible that there would be another node here like that because then 
from node three, I cannot go to two, but then two or three are not globally reachable in the initial, in the initial graph, right? Which is the property A that we have here, this property. Mm -hmm. So bottom line, we're gonna use this precisely in averaging algorithms. It will be useful to know that the graph contains the globally reach, the directed graph contains the global reachable if and only if the condensation contains a unique sink. All right. And that's a proof here. It's just a, lot, a little bit about logic. Now, finally, I am ready to do the last section of this chapter and it define for you weighted digraphs, weighted digraphs. So we have talked so far at length about graphs versus digraphs. Hmm? Now, for the case of digraphs, I also right now want to I need to begin to talk to you about, about uh, the concept that you can associate matrices to, to graphs. Perfect. So here's, here's the concept. So um, in a weighted diagraph, as it is illustrated in this picture, you don't only have directed edges, hmm? but you also have weights or numbers associated to each edge. The numbers by convention cannot be negative. So there, it's either zero, having a zero number is exactly the same as having no edge. So if you have an edge, the weight has to be essentially positive or by extension, you can imagine uh, considering the complete directed graph and everywhere there is a zero, you don't draw the edge. Right now, I want to give uh, symbols and names for those weights. So, for example, if I look at this edge from two to four, I will write a sub two four equal to one point two. So I will denote the weight of the edge from two to four, the directed edge. I will denote its weight with the letter a sub two four. A sub two four. So. Now, there is a convention that I'm using. The convention is that it's a little bit of an obvious convention. The convention is that if I have two, four, then the subscripts are two and four. Hmm? I know that you will not believe me, but in some literature, people consider an edge ij and associate to that edge the coefficient aji. Hmm? So this is a different convention. Okay, it's a convention that we do not adopt in this in this class. Okay, so this is. Uh, let me make it clear. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, strike this out. This is not our convention. Our convention is the one here. It's the one whereby uh, if we have a node, um, if we have a node uh, i j to the node i j, we associate the weight i j. Hmm? I was about to write it precisely wrong. Perfect. All right. Uh, a weighted digraph is said to be undirected if aij is equal to aji. When you write aij equal to aji, you're also implying that whenever ij is an edge, then also ji is an edge. Hmm? All right, perfect, perfect. And now one little things you can do is uh, if you have, like I had done drawn before, half an hour ago, if you have a node V and it has, and it has multiple in and out neighbors, then you can associate uh, you know, weights on all of these edges, right? So actually, let me slightly change notation. Let's suppose this node is the node i. Hmm? Um, then I can, I can sum a i j under j. This is the sum of the weights of outgoing edges, right? Because now the edge is going from I to J. So it's going out. And the reason is because in the sum, the first index there, here, the first index is I. So if I sum a I J, um, this is called the weighted out degree. This is D out of node i equal to that. 
On the other hand, I could sum those weights. So I sum, I sum those weights. I, I sum the weights going out. I could sum the weights coming in, and I could define B in of node I to be the sum, J runs from one to N, of A, J, I. Now these are the weights into I, you know? And so that's the, the, uh, the weighted in degree. So remember earlier we talked about the in, the, the in degree and out degree. Now we have the weighted in degree and the weighted out degree. And they're different from the usual degrees because here now you're actually summing the weights. Hmm? You're summing the weights. Now they would be the same. They become equal when all of the weights on the graph are equal to one. But weights in graphs typically are, are you know, heterogeneous. Hmm? And just like we did before, a weighted graph can be said to be weight balanced. Now a graph is weight balanced when the sum for each node, the sum of the incoming weights is equal to the sum of the outgoing weights. So in other words, for all nodes i, d in i is equal to d out i. So that's the property of regularity uh, of balanced. Same weight coming in is equal to the weight going out. All right, perfect. Um, with this, uh, I, this is the conclusion of chapter three. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, um, let's go back to the introduction here. Um, I have, uh, right, we've seen a lot of language, right? Especially the language of, uh, uh, this is a little summary now. We've seen the language of, uh, of uh, graphs and digraphs, the language of, of paths on graphs, um, and connectivity. And we've seen that connectivity notions become more elaborate when you go from graphs to digraphs. You can do the strongly connected decomposition, sorry, the decomposition to strongly connected components, and that's the condensation. And also at the end, we also briefly began to see what does it mean for a graph to be weighted. All right, and with this, thank you all very much. And we'll be back, uh, see you soon again. Thank you, bye.